My name is Vanessa Carlos and I run a gallery in London called Carlos Ishikawa. The gallery started in 2011 um, and it shows international artists. Um, most of them are having their first solo shows in London. And um, my background is, I was working for other commercial galleries, but I was also curating a lot of performance events, sometimes for institutions. Um, and I was also running a, a non-profit project space with one of the artists and I represent. So we do have a, f we ended up having a focus in a more sort of performative, um, experimental program, I would say. I'm not sure, I think I had a foot in all different fields. Like I trained as an artist myself and then I worked for commercial galleries. But as I said, I was curating freelance for museums, running non-profits, and it seemed like um, it was quite a scary step, but I had someone who wanted to invest in the business and I felt like it was a more interesting way of developing a longer relationship with these artists that I was collaborating with, which suits my personality better to have a sort of more involved, ongoing um, relationship and collaboration than a one-off. The biggest challenge, I think right now it's a really difficult time for young galleries and all the young galleries I speak to have share similar concerns. And one of them is that I think that the, the structures and models that we inherited um, from the galleries that opened up in the 90s, they, they're not functioning anymore. The landscape has changed too much and I think that, um, for example, uh, galleries opened in the 90s there were fewer of them they were able to grow with their artists and this is much harder now um, there weren't that many art fairs and the cost involved with doing art fairs as we know is super high so I think that um, a lot of the things that are expected of galleries now they're like much more ex like difficult and financial and uh, competitive expectations put on galleries now than there were before but at the same time we're in a, a sort of landscape where there's much less room for development for young galleries. I think that the problem is that right now the art world is a microcosm of the world at large so all these problems we have with neoliberalism in places like the UK or with you know just the, the capitalist structure that we all exist in is reflected in the art world and that structure that neoliberal structure favors corporations it doesn't favor um, independence and I think that in a situation like that in the world at large and in the art world then you want to act collectively that's one of the few ways that you can exist so I'm really interested in young galleries developing this collective and collaborative mentality and helping each other and also um, in us reinventing the way that we want to operate I don't think we should just accept these conventions and structures that are being sort of handed over to us um, you know, to some degree we have a lot of power in this situation because our generation is the, hopefully the next one that will be, um, will be showing artists for many years to come and I think that it's really important that we recognize that we have that power to, to change things that aren't working for us. Uh, last year in London I organized a project called Condo which was um, I invited eight London galleries to split up their spaces and invite foreign galleries to um, have an exhibition. So it was very much about ways of looking, you know, because we go to so many art fairs, we look at blogs all the time, but we don't spend that much time in exhibitions anymore. So this way we could enable each other to exhibit abroad. Um, and the London galleries just gave in kind, so they didn't pay any money. So they gave in kind as in they lent their spaces and their staff and so on. And the foreign galleries only paid the minimum amounts to cover um, like a, a joint dinner and printing the flyers and this kind of thing and um, it was very generous to audiences as well because it meant that you can go to two locations and see 10 exhibitions and it was generous to foreign galleries because it gives them basically a free gallery space in London for a month and it, it worked really well it worked better than I had hoped and it also opened up room for a lot of discussions amongst galleries about how we would like to operate going forward. And for this next year, I'm excited that a lot of established galleries have actually contacted me, um, interested in taking part. And, you know, that was really nice because it goes to show that uh, it's not just younger galleries who, who are peripheral to, the, to a bigger market system that are interested in acting more communally or to enabling each other. Um, and it's not like an attempt to eradicate art fairs, but perhaps it's an attempt to uh, do fewer art fairs. 
and if in different cities we all sort of hosted each other in this kind of way and came together and joined our mailing lists in this kind of way, then, um, you know, we all have these beautiful spaces in, in these cities and then, and then we're paying fortunes to be in a, a temporary, like, exhibition stand in, in an art fair somewhere in the world. And um, those are necessary, but I think that we don't need, the, you know, there's other ways also of us um, working and I think that art fairs also sometimes put pressure on galleries to show more commercial work and this is a way by keeping costs so low uh, to exhibit your artists abroad that you can uh, you can encourage more experimental exhibitions. Yeah we got a lot of press which was nice because we didn't publicize the project at all we just had a website and we all um, emailed our mailing list so th that was really encouraging because it showed that um, there's an appetite in the art world to open up a discussion about these things. Well, I think that uh, for me, when I came up with the idea of Kondo, the idea was to propose one alternative way of doing things. And in this case, like the alternative um, was like one way of like showing abroad without necessarily doing art fairs. But from that group of galleries, there emerged many really interesting discussions, actually. So one of them was... Um, discussing that, for example, maybe in London, for the young galleries, we would like to establish uh, agreements with artists, like formalized agreements that wouldn't protect just the gallery, but they would also protect the artists. And, you know, if it was something that we then in, uh, introduce, and it's across the board, then, then, you know, any artist who's working with a young gallery in London will be working under very clear agreement with them. And that's easy enough to implement, I think, uh, with the 10 or 12 young galleries in London that that we're talking about. So I think from that initiative, I feel like lots of positive discussions and, and actual uh, decisions like have come about, you know, or we also wrote to one of our museums who we felt wasn't really um, engaging with the young artists and young galleries in London. We wrote to them together asking that, you know, that maybe they they take more time and it really works. All the curators have come up to us and have been more uh, mindful of engaging with us. So it, I feel like it, yeah, that, that if we push and push, then we do come together and, and do things. But yeah, for sure, a lot of the time people complain and don't really take any action. We, we do online sales in that, you know, a lot of our sales are um, JPEGs, PDFs, but we don't, I, I have to say, I don't think anyone's done an online selling platform very well so far. I think there's like potential for that, but I don't feel that anyone's done it very well yet. The times that we've been invited, like an online platform that's affiliated with a fair has invited us to list works. Um, I feel like we don't get many inquiries. And I, I think the failure has to do a lot with um, the way that they're doing it, it requires a more personal informed exchange and right now people don't put their best works on. You have to trust the platform that you're um, putting those works on. So I kind of feel like, you know, if someone like Art Basel made an online sales platform, then it would work because there's already a selection process and there is um, a sort of trusted uh, context, that bring, an umbrella that brings all the galleries together. Right now it's a bit of a mishmash and there's, yeah. I don't think that that's threatening to galleries. I think there's room for all of those things to coexist, but done well. I think people have a very physical relationship to artworks, and artworks have a very uh, also sensorial aspect, spatial aspect. People will always want to be physically in the presence of an exhibition, and um, at the same time, you know, and we're all looking at images on blogs all the time. We're buying artworks online. We're looking at exhibitions that we can't travel to. So I think that. Th those things are sort of accepted uh, ways of engaging with art now. I think that the online selling platform is something like Art Tuner is not that different to emailing a gallery and receiving a PDF and buying a work from a JPEG. Um, so I think that I think that it's it's only natural that all those things will um, reinforce each other and coexist. But I just feel that there's not the ideal online platform yet. And I'm not sure if there will be, because I think the final boundary or, or frontier with that is like uh, transparency. Nobody, you know, you, I don't know if you're going to find a time when you have um, prices for artworks, on, for all types of artworks online. So right now in platforms like Artsy or this kind of thing, like it's already a, a, a works that have been selected because um, 
the prices can be divulged, but I, I don't think that, um, you know, you would ever have like a full galleries inventory online that you could just go and buy at the click of a button when so much of it is relationship based and galleries are trying to be careful about placing works and really considering how um, those works will exist. That's interesting, yeah. Well, actually, secondary market is so full of, um, you know, the, the margins where people really make their profits are the things that are so fluid and, uh, and what people wouldn't be transparent about. So I don't know. I mean, obviously, it works really well for online bidding and it works well for, maybe it works well for, as a point of access. And once you've accessed the artwork, then you have a discussion with the gallery. I think that's probably, I don't think you'll ever be buying all art at the click of a button. I think that it's such a specific case because Oscar Murillo had such a specific trajectory. There's not many artists who had that kind of trajectory. And in the end, you know, he really needed some a gallery like David Sverner. So I'm happy that he ended up there because um, it can offer so much and it's a stability to someone like him. Um, the challenge is just uh, the challenge is that you you operate in different universes in a way. Although you have this similar clients. It's such a different, um, you know, Oscar and I, we used to discuss, like, for example, I remember trying to sell his work uh, for, you know, not much money and people wouldn't buy it. And, and I'd get very frustrated that then people were interested. And he said to me, you know, he said, well, in a depressing way, but it's kind of like, you know, where does somebody want to buy a luxury handbag? Do they want to go to the flagship store in Mayfair? Do they want to go to a boutique in Shoreditch? You know, do they want to go to a department store? Do they want to go to Selfridges? And, and really, the, the, that branding aspect of a gallery, or the context of a gallery, is, is you know, undeniable. It's difficult. You're, like, you're happy for the artist, but of course, it, it means that you can't develop with the artist in the way that you would have liked. But of course, you benefit from it as well. You benefit from that relationship. Um, but ultimately, the thing that maybe is more challenging is that it's just the, 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 it feels like the realities are so different, and therefore the dialogue. It's almost like you, you could, you, it's almost like you're speaking different languages, and you couldn't really. Um, you're not thinking about, you're not considering the same things when you're working with that artist. So it becomes, you collaborate and you work well together, but you're you're sort of focused on different things, and um, so it, the collaboration is 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 less. Um, encompassing than it is when I work with other young galleries. Yeah. This is something that, you know, anywhere else would be regulated. So if you were buying a house, you put a deposit, if you change your mind, you've lost a deposit. And this is something, you know, the art world has got by on a handshake for a long time. But I've heard of, for example, um, a gallery that did Miami one year, and one collector loved the booth, bought the whole thing, and then, um, and then later, when the fair was over, said, actually, sorry, I can't take it. And the gallery nearly went bust from this. So I'm not sure, like, it would take regulation, not regulation, but it would take some sort of agreement across the board of how to operate. But, you know, there would be, there would be ways of protecting galleries that all other industries have, you know. So if you commit to buying a work during a fair, you know, if you drop out, then maybe there's a deposit. You know, just very basic things that other people do. And um, it, you're right, I think it is becoming more and more customary. I hear more and more, like me and my colleagues often say, that, you know, sales only happen when we see them, the payment actually arrive. And I think um, that perhaps artists as well as collectors um, are not very aware of the, the precarious positions that galleries often have and the cash flow, how it works, and the huge overheads. And I think that galleries are also guilty because they want to sort of protect their, their artists from that knowledge. They want to sort of maintain appearances and they're not straight about what those costs are. And, um, you know, uh, on the surface, everyone's spending a lot of money on expensive designer furniture and art fairs and lifestyle. And actually, um, I think that then that gives, that gives collectors the impression that they can take those liberties of, of not taking those sales so seriously when actually for a lot of galleries, they can really like make or break. Um, it's difficult because, you know, galleries are always doing research. I go to most of the degree shows in London. Whenever I travel, I see as many shows as I can. If anybody who I trust um, 
mentions an artist to me, especially one of my artists. I will always do a studio visit with one of the artists. If one of my artists recommends that I look at something else, we're always looking at magazines. So we're always looking, and I think that obviously approaching a gallery directly doesn't work because we receive so many uh, sub unsolicited submissions. So I don't think that that works. But I think when I was in, in art school and organizing our own shows, I think that's something that had a good um, outcome and a good energy was we would self-organize. We'd just find somebody's living room, put up an exhibition, everyone who's in the exhibition, we call our friends, we call people we know. And um, because galleries are always looking and artists are always wanting to show. So if you self-organize and manage to create a good energy and again, act, co act collectively as artists and collaborate by like putting on a self-organized exhibition together, then most young galleries are interested in going to those things. And so I think that's much more productive and effective for a young artist than it is to send emails with JPEGs, you know, because galleries are receiving hundreds of them all the time.